All right, I've got time to start a little bit after. So, I'll go ahead and get started this morning with a Bible study. If you notice, I have uh, put together a book. I got real fancy with binding up our Bible studies. So, if you'll grab one of those. Now, here's the deal. I used to do this for the teens and stuff, and I would tell them, if you want to leave it here, that's fine. You can put your name on it, leave it. If you want to take it with you, that's fine. But if you take it home, you have to bring it back each week. <laughs> okay? Because <laughs> so, it took me like a whole day to put these together. And I'm not going to keep putting them together every week because you all forget them at home. But I would like you to take them, and if you can bring them back, great. And uh, you can look through them, look at the lessons ahead. But I thought it would be sim more simple just to have all the lessons compiled uh, together uh, into a booklet as we go through the study in the church. And so uh, we're going to be looking in Lesson 3 this morning uh, with uh, Universal versus Local Church. Now, I, I want to mention also, if you see Ryan Hasty, which is with the Auburn, or the University Church of Christ in Auburn, Alabama, is the one who uh, put this study together, and I really like <laughs> how he's done it. So we're using his material uh, so it's really good. So I want to make sure he, he has credit for that as well. Um, hopefully you're enjoying the study, and we'll continue to enjoy the study as we talk about the church. Before we get started, let's, uh, any other uh, announcements or news that we need to get to? I know if you've got the Kingston Weekly, please look on that. There's several on our prayer list. Uh, Jackson is still having a hard time after having his wisdom teeth removed. Um, I know that uh, Austin... Uh, checked himself out yesterday, and they're trying to see about getting him in a new program today. So keep praying for Austin. That's Steve uh, and Teresa Goodpasture's grandson. It's good to see Margaret back. So I was thinking, oh, that, there you are. Okay, good. I was thinking, it's good to see you this morning. So how are you feeling? Good. Yeah. Yeah, well, take it easy. So it's good to see you. Uh, anything else we need to update on our prayer list or add that's not on there? I, we haven't heard from her other, he just said that she's doing good. But. Yeah, I, I texted him this past uh, couple days, uh, two days ago or so, and uh, he said that she was having him do a lot, and I said something about, does she have a little bell? He said, no, I took the bell away. <laughs> so that's, that's as much as I've gotten out of it, so apparently I, I'm taking that as good news, so, uh, <laughs> but uh, from what I understand, she's doing pretty good, just, you know, trying to, to re rehabilitate and heal up, so anything else? All right, let's go to God in prayer, and we'll get started with Bible study this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for blessing us and watching over us. Lord, we pray that this morning as we begin our study and we continue to talk about uh, this great living body we call the church, that, Lord, we are so thankful that you've given us, uh, that we're a part of this family of believers. Lord, pray that you help our study this morning to be uh, beneficial to us to help us uh, to reevaluate our own lives as, as far as our service to you and to the church, but also, Lord, build strength upon uh, the foundation you've laid. Lord, we pray that you watch over us and guide us each day. Be with our leaders here as they continue to lead uh, this, this congregation. Lord, we pray that you help us to be strong and to, uh, to Lord, to grow and to, to reach out to those around us. Lord, pray, Lord, that you, that you be with those that are part of our family right now, Lord, that, that need prayers. We have a long list of names, and Lord, we just ask that you continue to look over those. Lord, we pray that you be with Elise Eaton with her recent diagnos diagnosis of uh, cancer. Lord, we ask that you help her to uh, be healed from this and, and be with the surgeon and doctors that are looking after her at this time and, and are discussing her options. Lord, we just pray that you, you move within her life and, and within this process and heal her body. 
Lord, pray that you be with Austin as he's had uh, many medical issues and health struggles. And Lord, just be with him and his family, Lord, as they're trying to get him the help he needs and continue to, to help him to, to overcome the obstacles that he is facing. Lord, pray that you be with uh, Della and the start of her uh, new class on these uh, Thursdays. Lord, we just pray that you help that to be a great success and uh, be with the ladies that are studying and, and help that to be um, a great opportunity for growth and for evangelism and outreach. Lord, we pray you be with Jackson, who is still having some troubles after his wisdom teeth surgery and, and pain. Lord, we pray that you help him to, uh, to heal quickly and that pain to subside. Well, I know there's many others that uh, have not mentioned that need prayer and uplifting. And Lord, we just pray you help us to do that. And help us to find ways and opportunities to reach out and to minister to each other and to the people around us. Lord, help us to plant seed wherever we go. So I pray in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So if you each books, as I said, we're going to be in uh, lesson three. Universal versus local church. What do we mean, when, first of all, in understanding the difference between universal and local, what do we mean by universal and local? Okay, we have brothers and sisters all over the world, right? And so we think about the church as a universal church. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means that we're just a small part of a larger body, right? Uh, have you ever, had, you ever had those experiences where you go somewhere, especially if you've grown up in the church, been around, you've done mission trips or whatever, where you, you, you could be somewhere completely out of your element and far away and still find somebody you can connect with that knows somebody you know or you have some connection with from a previous church or whatever. You ever been that, had that happen? Uh, happens all the time to me. And, and uh, people say, well, man, it's just, it's a small world, isn't it? And I like to say, no, it's a big world, but it's a small fellowship. And so part of the church, even though we're a universal body, uh, we're a body with members all over the world, but it is nice that, that even wherever we go, we're, we're, the Kingston Church of Christ is a small part of a larger body of believers who, who have a faith in God and that belong to the church, or brothers and sisters in, in Christ everywhere. Uh, and so then we also have the local church, which is what we are, uh, a local congregation that is a, a representation and a part of the church here in Kingston. And in some communities and towns, like even here and other places, you'll have a couple different churches, smaller bodies, that represent the church within that community. And so that's, that's the universal versus local church we're going to talk about this morning. So look at the introduction in the book. Understanding the nature of the church begins with understanding what the word church actually means. So last week we talked about what the, church, the word uh, church actually means and what did we say it was. What's the Greek word? <laughs> it's, a, it's a test. What's the Greek word? <laughs> huh? Ecclesia. Uh huh. Ecclesia. Ecclesia, which means called out. So the church are called out of. What are we called out of? The world. The world, right? We're called out of the world. We're separated. We're to be different, apart from the rest of the world. That's why when you look at the church, we should not look like the rest of the world, right? Now, of course, we're going to have some similarities and, and culture affects the church and other things, but we still have to look different and be different from the rest of the world. And that's why we're to be called out. Church describes a group of Christians who've been called out of sin and death and into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what we are. That's who we are. Uh, and we say this over and over again, the church is not what? Our building. The church is not our building, it's not our facilities. Uh, it, it's the, even as far as, it's not even our programs. Those, that's not what the church is, the church is us. The church is the people, the relationships, 
those who have been called out. And so we have to be real careful because isn't that, a, isn't that the danger of churches? That we become more about our buildings? Matter of fact, one of the complaints you see with people in the world, of people in the church, is because uh, based on our buildings, our, our structures, or how we, we are perceived by them, uh, and that's not who we are. We're not our buildings. And so it's okay to build these buildings and have nice facilities and, uh, and, and put money and time and resources into it. But we've also got to remember, there are a lot of churches that put more money in their buildings than they do in their outreach. Put more money into their buildings than they do their missions or to programs or to uh, things that really make a difference for evangelism. And you can build a building and make it look nice and pretty and, and make everybody that's a part of that congregation feel happy and locked in and safe from the rest of the world, but that's not who the church is supposed to be. We're not supposed to be, uh, we're called out, but not called to be separated and, and put off to the side and protect ourselves to where we're not around the world and, and helping evangelize. Because part of being called out is to be the representation, to be the ambassadors. So uh, think about that as we look through the studies. Look at B under introduction, New Testament. The word church is used in two senses. It's used as a universal church. Every Christian, both past, present, and future, who is saved is a member of the universal church. Uh, a local church, Christians within a geographical area that work and worship together as a local congregation of God's people. Those are the two things you see in, in New Testament. When it looks at church, you see those two different things. When you think of universal within the New Testament, what comes to your mind? Uh, of examples or, or something that you could relate this to as saying, uh, this would be kind of an example of what we see in the New Testament as a universal church. Where do we see that? Okay, meeting in homes, okay, that could be part of it. That could also be part of the local church, right? Uh, where else do we see universal church where every Christian, both past, present, and future, uh, is a member of that universal church? Okay, yeah, Jews and Gentiles. You can, you can see that in that fact that Paul himself became a missionary to the Gentile world. We see him going to Greece, and we see him coming back and reporting to Jerusalem about the Christians abroad. And, and there was even discussion when we talked about the book of Acts where um, they want to know about the difference between circumcision and the different issues that were going on because why? There's different in cultures, but they were part of a universal church. And that's what came back to is, hey, we're not going to bind things on them because we're all one in Christ. That's, that's universal. But then we also see where times uh, where Paul even addresses in some of his, his letters were to specific congregations. Hey, you need, you need to tell the congregation here to be aware of this, to watch after this. Uh, you know, appoint elders in each city. That's, that's your local church, okay? Uh, though the actual terms universal and local church are not explicitly mentioned in the Bible, it's the concept, the concept that we're teaching. Um, in this study, we'll contrast those two, noticing how the New Testament delineates between the two. Um, failure to observe this distinction leads us to open uh, us open to erroneous concepts regarding the church. It also presents a confusing picture of the church to unbelievers. Uh, how can how can not understanding what the church is give uh, uh, unbelievers the wrong impression? Okay, that we're not getting along. Yeah, that's a good example, like that. 
Anybody else feel like that? When people see what, the way you talk to your brothers or sisters, they might go, man, they're really mean to each other. But that's just the way you, you handle each other, right? Uh, Rachel has two brothers. I have two sisters. It's a total different uh, kind of way we relate. So when I'm around my sisters, I was always taught to be, you know, to open the door for them. To, to you know, my, my father would make me, I used to hate it when I was a, was a kid. I thought, I don't want to stand up. I said, but when they come to the table, my dad would make me stand up. If they went to the bathroom and came back, we stood up and had pulled the chairs out. Let, not, my sisters, really? Come on. If I was dating a girl, I could see, but these are my sisters. I want to pull the, t- the chair out for them. You know? uh, but, then I, but I learned. It was good. It was good training for me to learn. But, you know, it was, so that was different. You go to Rachel's family, and really, she was kind of like one of the boys because she had two brothers, and it's, it's like they dog each other. I mean, it, you, you want to see a different side of Rachel, go be around her and her brothers. It's really funny because they, they'll tear each other up. And it's kind of a good example. You think, man, when I first started going to their family, I'm like, man, they really hate each other. But they don't. That's their way they show love. They, you know, they, they kid and joke around harshly. If I did that with my sisters, I'd make them cry. I'd get in trouble and, you know, it'd be rough. But, yeah, you've got to be careful how people are, how we represent ourselves. But some of it we can. We can look rough to the world uh, when we don't have that unity. Uh, so let's look at universal church. Who is the church composed of? That's what we'll look at. Who is the church composed of? Look at Hebrews chapter 12. As you go through the study, I uh, hope you have your Bibles open or your apps. Hebrews chapter 12. And some read 18 through 24. Somebody got that? So in verse 23, who does the Hebrew writer say are enrolled in heaven? Look at verse 23 again. The name's written in heaven. Okay? Uh, My translation says, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Who is that? Christians. Christians. Okay? So every Christian is a part of what? Right? The heavenly body. The general assembly. Mm -hmm. The full assembly. I like that. The full assembly. The general assembly which is enrolled in heaven. If you look down in your outline, it says this tells us that every person who's a Christian is a member of the universal church. The church... uh, that, that is all around the world. So that, that means that my brothers and sisters in Christ that are in Europe, China, Middle East, Africa, South America, all around the world, we are all a family. We're all part of the, the great assembly. Uh, we're part of the firstborn. Okay? So how many are there? Look at, look at question two. Read, let's read Ephesians chapter four. We read verse four.
Okay? We read that verse, what, what comes to your mind? What do you think about that, that verse? What is he saying? In regards to the unity of the body of Christ, what is, what is he telling us as Christians then? Okay. He said we belong to one. There's one Lord. There's nobody else but one Lord. Right? We're called the one faith. What is that one faith? Jesus is our Savior. Not only is our Savior, but he is the Son of God who came to earth. Our one faith is the fact that Jesus was Christ, Son of God, who was sent to earth to redeem us of our sins and died on the cross for our sins. And that he was buried and he rose again. That's our faith that, that, that God gave us the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We had that one faith and that one baptism. What is the one baptism? Okay. What's the examples we have in Scripture of the one baptism? See, I think, I think we've got to make sure we, we really read through these things because as a church, there's, there's one Lord, there's one faith. We, a lot of times we check, check, and say one baptism. Well, wait a minute. Well, that could do this. That. I think we have to look and say, what was the baptism within the New Testament church? Baptism for the remission of sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the death, burial, and resurrection that we go through just as Christ went through. And so it's an immersion. It's a raising again. And so that's the one, those are the one things we have to, to be a part of. There's one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And so I say that because I think there's a lot of things that we talk about, well, do we have to believe things the exact same way and do things the exact same way? No, the, the church universally, we are one in those three things. But individually, as smaller churches, I think that's the autonomy, that, that we can have some diversity and some differences as long as we're part of the one true Lord and faith and baptism that talks about, right? Uh, that, that we have to be aware of. So that's one of the things we see, that, that every Christian is a part of the general assembly, and that what the first thing that Paul says there is only one of uh, are these, there's one Lord. Uh, and since there's only one body, there can only be one church. Now this becomes pretty sticky because <laughs> we look around, there's not just one church, is there? And, and so since there's only one body, there can only be one church. If there were more than one church, Paul would not have insisted on there being one body. So you think about that. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah. He, he was our new covenant. And what we're left with is, is one body, one church. So how do we get to where we have all these various churches? What happened? They got to pay for Okay. Okay, so if they have to be the same as us, what has to be the same? The doctrine. The doctrine. The heart. The doctrine. Uh, the doctrine, the belief is what we just read. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One body. Right? Uh, and so I think as a church, we need to understand that. That that is, that is what makes us one. And that's what makes us one around the world is that one body. And, and, and we've got to understand that. Look at Acts chapter 2. 
I'm not going to read all of this because we've read it many times before, but you look at verses 1 through 47. It contains the first gospel sermon as well as the first conversation uh, that we have. And part of that conversation was he, uh, as we've mentioned before, Peter tells them what they've done as a people. Uh, he tells them how they've crucified the Lord that was prophesied about, how he was the one who was to come. And when they all saw it, and they all realized what they had done, they asked the question, what must we do? And he gave them the answer, didn't he? Repent and be baptized. Right? Uh, look at Acts chapter 11, verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so we see that the, the baptism of the New Testament is a baptism of immersion of water for the remission of our sins where we receive the Holy Spirit was a baptism of the Holy Spirit as well. So that is what, that's what brings us into this one body, the church. Everything has a beginning, including the church, doesn't it? Everything has a beginning. <clears throat> but who adds us to the church? Do we add ourselves to the church? Does a leadership add a person to the church? Okay. You've got to be taught. But who adds someone to the church? Is that, is that left for one of us to do that? Do we vote on it? No. How are you added to the church then? Yeah. By being saved. And so you've got to understand what being saved is about and how you do that. There is a process. Right? And through scripture we see that the one, the, the one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one baptism is a part of you've got to be baptized for the remission of your sins to be added to the body of Christ to receive the Holy Spirit. It's all a part of the package, okay? Uh, you, you can't just do one without the other. And so that's the one baptism. So the, all those who have repented of their sins, who've come to Christ, who've been, who've been baptized for remission of their sins, who've been added to the church, they are added by the Holy Spirit and through Jesus Christ's blood, they're added. It's a spiritual addition, right? That I can't add somebody to the church, God adds them to the church by obedience to his will. Okay? Uh, anybody have any questions so far? Let's look at Acts, um, let's get on to, down to chapter, or, sorry, question five. So if no man can add a person to the universal church, and this is left alone only to the Lord, alone holds that privilege. A person is added to his body by following the same example of obedience that the Jews in Acts 2, 2 followed, namely to believe, repent, confess, and be baptized in water. Uh, so who keeps the membership book then? Anybody know what a membership book? You ever had to sign a signed membership book? Have you been a member of something before? I've been a member of Kiwanis, Rotary, several other little clubs and things over the years. And you always had to sign that book when you went in to eat or whatever, and that's how they knew who had to pay their dues and who, who had, to, had been there and who had not, you know? So, what about the church? How does that relate to us? Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. <coughs> Who can read verse 22 through 23? But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in the joyful assembly, to the church whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, who the spirits of the righteous made perfect. 
Okay. So who 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 keeps our membership? God, right? Well, we're gathered, the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God. And it says, the judge of all, and to the spirit of the righteous made perfect. You know, that right there saying, you know, that we're enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirit of the righteous made perfect. Who is our judge? Who is it? God. Uh, now, this, this is something that I think we need to think about, too, is because I've, I've had a lot of people as we go through the church, and about, well, you know, I, I've had many conversations where people have said, so you think that if we're not a member of the church, or the church of Christ, or whatever, that we're not going to heaven, or whatever? And I'm not going to say that. And I've had people... Uh, argue or want to argue about things like that and, and well so you're saying if I'm not baptized then, then I'm not saved so I'm say, well are you saying that my parents then were not saved or, you know what my answer is because there's scriptures like this God does not give me permission to judge that and I cannot tell you that I can't God does not allow me to make those decisions so if you're asking me to make judgment on that I can't that's, that's, that's to God all I can tell you is what I know Scripture te teaches. And I can teach what I know Scripture to teach. And on Judgment Day, if God says, hey, you know, you didn't, you didn't do everything that I would command in the Bible, but you know what, I'm going to let you in. That's completely up to God. I have no right or authority to question that. And in some ways, it's, it's really liberating to think that way because it is up to God. God judges all. And his, his righteousness is made perfect. And so I have no right to judge somebody else's salvation. It's up to each person individually to, to know and to do what is instructed to them in the scripture. Right? But what I do know is to teach of what the church is and how you're to get into the church and the kind of baptism we're supposed to have based on scripture. But I love that the, the part that it, it also takes that burden away from because the assembly of the firstborn who enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. God judges that. We as a church body, we don't have to keep the membership book. Uh, I've, I've been around even some churches where somebody wants to, to place membership, and they want to go through a whole questionnaire and, and do this, do that, and, and well, explain this, explain that. You know, if somebody says they, they've been obedient to God's word, then, then I need to accept that. And if they haven't, hopefully over time of studying and being around a church body that teaches true doctrine and truth, if they haven't, they will decide that for themselves. But God is the just God. Okay? Mike, did you have something you wanted to say? I was going to say the same thing. I, I get to meet quite a few people here and there. And anytime I get challenged, you know, when I say church Christ, challenge is on. Okay? Yeah. So when I do that, just say, well, there's going to be a time for judgment, you know, and God's going to yeah. judge us all. But I'll be happy to study with you on anything you want, you know, and we can learn together. Yeah. Instead of driving the nail in it because we're the only ones going to heaven. You know yeah. What I mean? Yeah. And, and that is not my place, nor should be my focus. My focus is to teach the Word of God and, and to teach people what I know to be true. And if I'm teaching something that's false, then I need to correct that and change that. younger youth minister and, and I saw some things that I really thought, man, that just doesn't seem right. But um, and we had some really good elders, but we had uh, one that there was one gentleman there who'd been coming to church and he was just a godly man. Uh, 
young couple, young family, and he'd been studying with us uh, and uh, about Badge One Place memberships. We talked to him and stuff, and, and he'd come out of a, a different church background. And we studied with him, and we, we were talking about baptism and stuff. He goes, no, I, I believe I was baptized for the right reason. And uh, we said, okay, well, let's kind of talk about that. And he talked about it, and we felt very comfortable. That, well, yeah, it's a, he said, no, I know I was baptized for remission of sins. Uh, you know, I, I really feel like I did the right thing and stuff. And I remember one of our elders saying, yeah, but don't you want to be baptized again and make everybody else here feel a little more comfortable with you leaving if you did? I remember thinking, make other people feel more comfortable. See, that, to me, that's where I think we've got to be careful of how we, you know, uh, if you've got somebody saying, no, I, I believe I did the right thing, and that's on them, between them and God. But to have somebody do something, I thought, well, would that be any better? To make him do something that he's just doing because he wants to make everybody else feel better? That's just as wrong. So we've got to be careful in how we teach that. And, and, I, and I point, point this out because I think as the church, we have to be careful even in the church of Christ that we don't become denominationalized ourselves because of our name on our building. We are Christ church, the church of Christ, because we're trying to be the church of the New Testament. And we are autonomous, and so we're universal in the fact that all that are part of the one body, the one faith, one baptism, that we're a part of that. And that we have to be real careful that we don't, that we don't put on people and bind things on other people that we shouldn't. That our goal is to teach the truth and let people make the decisions and, and work out their own salvation. After all, that's scriptural. Uh, and and be a part of that body. Now, if they're, if they're in opposition to truth, then that's a whole other issue. But that's part of the universal part of the church. And when we think about the local body of Christians, that's where we look at here. Is there's, there's things that we are responsible to. We haven't really been able to get into all that, so we'll pick up on that next week in this lesson. We talk about the local church, because I know that that's, uh, that's something, there's a little bit of some difference there how the local church uh, began and, and kind of our responsibilities. Um, does anybody have any, any comments so far about what we're talking about? right. Yeah. Yeah, and we do. And, and that's where we have to be careful of that because there's a lot of great works going on around the world. People evangelizing that don't always look <laughs> like we think they should look or don't look like us. And that's okay. Um, that's okay. But we've got to be the one church because when it comes down to it, that's where our unity comes and that's what the world looks at. Uh, the world looks at how, how we behave with each other. When they see a church that's constantly bickering and fighting with each other and divided, and that's not what God wants. And I'll, I'll say that's not the church that we're supposed to be. And so it's very important that we think about what the church really is and who we're really supposed to be and how we're really supposed to act uh, as a church. So appreciate you guys being here this morning. We'll, uh, we'll break for uh, about 15 minutes and we'll start our worship. Thank you guys.
but uh, it really don't matter. I don't get in the long run. It's all God that saves me. Now that's one thing. Most other people think to be
Morning, Kingston Church. Glad to see everybody here this morning and those streaming online. Welcome to a wonderful morning. Uh, a couple announcements. Last week, Nancy Smith's brother-in-law passed away, and I did not get the name to put it in the thing this week, this morning, so I apologize for that. But Nancy's brother-in-law passed away. Um, then the rest of the announcements, uh, you can read. Um, hopefully Steve convinced Austin to go back to the hospital this morning. That's what we're hoping at least. That's all I have. Is there anything else that needs to be announced? Oh, men's steak dinner. It's at the bottom. Make sure you let me or Arthur know if you plan on attending as soon as possible so he can arrange the food and all that. So if you plan on going October the 2nd, please let us know and we'll take a list of who's all is going. Okay. Anything else? Uh, let me add it. If anybody wants a good steak, steak potatoes, it's on me. Y'all just let me know when it's going to if you'll be there. I think people had about two years ago and I think everybody enjoyed it. Arthur
Arthur said, it's going to be the most amazing steak that you've ever eaten <laughs> with a baked potato. And the best thing is, it's on him. So all them online people. So please, all men, uh, let me know if you plan on going. I'll start making a list so we can get it to Arthur so he can start planning with the Chef Ed. It's at Arthur's house. So anything else? OK, thanks. I'll guarantee you it's a great steak. I was there. It's outside of me. It's beautiful this time of year. Well, hello, church. This first song, I've been warned, might be hard without a big crew of ladies. So you ladies and gentlemen, sing your hearts out today. <coughs> Jesus. How he loves me, how I love him. He is risen, he is coming. Lord, come quickly. Have
The scripture reading this morning is from Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were sound, there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we have to come together to worship you in song, to approach you in prayer, to hear a lesson from thy word, and to remember our obligations and opportunities to give to support the work of the church here and of our mission work and of our benevolent work. Father, for all the blessings you've given each of us, we give you thanks for that portion of health that we enjoy because we know that there's others who are suffering in their health, physically, emotionally, mentally. We pray that you'd be with them, lift them up, heal them if it be your will. And Father, we uh, thank you for our freedoms we enjoy, that we can come together to worship you as you've uh, instructed us to. Be with us through this time and on through this week and let us work for you. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> 374. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's face and sin has plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty states lose all their guilty states lose all their guilty states and sin John 3, 16. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 reminds us that it was love that sent Jesus to the cross. It wasn't Pilate. It wasn't the Roman soldiers or the Jewish leaders. Yes, they were involved, but they weren't the ultimate cause. It was Jesus' love for you and for me that led him to the cross. You see, long before we thought or even cared about God, he cared about us. He cared enough to send his one and only son to a cross to die in our place. We'll never be able to fully understand this kind of love. This morning as we meet around the table to remember Jesus, God on earth, and what he did for us, and may we think about this love that he had, that God had for us. We'll never be able to understand it. But we should be thankful for that, the depths of our whole soul and the depths of our heart, the point that it should pull our heart to visualize the cross and Jesus taking those nails for us and hanging between heaven and earth. Let us pray. Dear God, our Father in heaven, what love you showed for us, what love Jesus had for us that he would go to the cross. Father, we could never understand, but we can be on our knees in humility and love for you and give thanks. As we remember our Savior this morning, may we do it in a way that's pleasing in your sight. May we recognize and commit our lives to you. May we recognize our souls, the need we have for you, Father. We're so thankful for Jesus. We're so thankful that he gave us the way that we can come to you. The only way that we can come to you. Father, be with us as we remember the body that was broken for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Dear Father, as we continue during this time of communion, a time of reflection, time of hope and thanksgiving, Father, we remember the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. And we're so thankful, Father, that we can be forgiven. 
As sinners here on this earth, Father, we could never come before you. But because of the blood that was shed, we can have a faith, a faith that leads to righteousness, and we can come to you. We're thankful we can be forgiven. Help us to walk in the light, Father. Help us to study your word. Help us to encourage each other. Help us to be better today than we were tomorrow or yesterday. Father, help us to be a light in this world, to encourage others, to encourage our brothers and sisters. Father, help us to do your will. We're so thankful for Jesus. And we're so thankful that he will come again. Be with us as we remember our Savior and the power of his shed blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, it's time to dismiss for children's church, youngsters. And this will be the song before the lesson. And if you like, stand and we'll sing one verse. <laughs> Some glad morning when this life is all fly away. to be doing that. If you haven't, that's fine. You can still pick up with whatever day we're on, and then when we get done, you can just circle back around and pick up the first few days. But today, <clears throat> on day 15, uh, as we spent the last several days focusing on the church family, uh, today we're asking everybody to be praying about individuals and families within the church. As you look around, you can see that we have uh, several families, and if you read the Kingston Weekly, you see we have those that need our prayers, so I encourage you to be praying for them uh, today as well as throughout the rest of this week. Uh, but also one of the challenges we have each day is, is something for you to do, and today it is if you can find somebody that could use some encouragement that you're thinking about, that you're praying for today, to also write them a note and let them know that you're praying for them as we continue going through uh, the next several days. Uh, we'll have about five more days where we're going to be praying about those in the church and the church body here at Kingston, and then we're moving on to, uh, to pray about our communities, our world around us, and we'll spend the next uh, 20 days doing that as we close out those days of prayer. So I appreciate those that are participating with that. You'll also notice that uh, on my left, your right, that we're getting very, very close to raising all the money we need for our Kenya trip. As I mentioned last week, uh, each person has to raise about 27 hundred dollars 
uh, that's going. And so that's the money from the six going from our group. And so we just have just a few thousand left, I think, and then we'll be up to where everybody's raised all their money for the trip, so that's exciting. And we leave on the 7th, so it's coming within two and a half weeks now to three weeks. Uh, we'll be taking off and going over to, to Nairobi, Kenya for the mission trip over there. So please keep that in your prayers this week as well, uh, and appreciate you doing that. So today I am going to be uh, doing the lesson on, our third lesson on prayer for dummies. And uh, I'm not sure if it'll be a shorter sermon, but I know I've got, I have to take off fairly quickly afterwards because I'm flying to Michigan uh, this afternoon and have to drive to Nashville to catch a flight. Uh, but my mother has been on me, yes, even when you're a grown man, your mother still gets on you, that I have not visited her in Michigan since she remarried and moved up there. And uh, so she called me this past week and said, I want to see you before you go to, to Kenya. I said, well, I, I, you know, I'm real busy, got a lot of things going on. And she said, I don't care, you're coming up here. I said, okay, but I, you know, it's a long drive. She goes, I'm paying for the plane ticket. I said, I'm coming. So, so she has bought me a plane ticket, so I won't leave and go this afternoon and, and be back by Wednesday. So it's going to be a quick trip, but play for, pray for my travel and flight today, and, and I get to spend some time with my mom. Uh, I am a mama's boy, as I've mentioned before, so I'm looking forward to, to getting to see her and spend some time with her. Every day, the Postal Service uh, has returned mail. Uh, maybe some of you have had things returned or you've re returned a sender on it, but every day they get mail and every year there's, there's certain times of the year they get a lot of mail. Of course, they get letters from Santa that they collect and they're not quite sure. They, they send the North Pole or whatever, you know, they're not sure about that. But did you know that they get a lot of mail addressed to God? Did you know that? That people actually write God letters and they send it to the postal service. And so every year they get hundreds and thousands of letters that are addressed to God. Well, I think, where, where do we send these letters? Where do they go? Well, of course, I think God knows what's already in them, but uh, what do we do with them? And so they decide, well, we'll start reading some of them. And one postal service said, we'll, we'll read some of them, we'll try to answer some of them. And one of those letters was an old Israeli man who wrote to God, and said, God, I need 5,000 shekels, which is about $1,000. I need 5,000 shekels because they're about to take this little piece of land that's mine, and, and I don't have the money, and I'm going to lose this small piece of land if I don't have uh, this, and it's been a part of my family's inheritance. Well, the Postal Service, they saw this letter, and one of the workers was so moved by this letter that they got with all the other postal workers at this Postal Service area, and they pulled together... 4,300 shekels, and they sent it to the man. Well, according to the London Times, the man wrote God again. And this is what he said. Thank you, God, for the contribution. But next time, please don't send it through the postal department. They are thieves, and they stole 700 shekels. <laughs> See, we all recognize... That the way things are does not represent the way God wants them to be. Right? God wants to give and to do and to act in our lives in ways that seem so rarely uh, possible for us. And he wants to act in ways that we seem to rarely actually realize that he wants to do for us. The way things are is the way God wants things to be. We also know that God is not without the resources to change the way things are. We know that, don't we? We, we know that, that God has all the resources. If he wants something changed, he's going to change it. You know why? Because as we read the scripture, as we sing in songs, our God reigns. He is king. He reigns in this world. And that's exciting news. It should be exciting for all of us to think this morning that God reigns in our lives especially when we pray to him. If we do not believe that, then what point is it to be here this morning? What point is it to even study the power of prayer and how to pray more effectively if we don't believe that God reigns? 
That God can, can move in my life and change things in my life. And the things that are that, I, that I'm not necessarily happy with, the things that I want to change, that if I don't really believe he can do anything about it, what's the point? And I, I think we all know that he can. Why should we ever ask the Lord, teach us to pray, if he's not sovereign? If he's not on the throne, what good is it to pray to him? Well, that's the great thing about this morning. But he is on the throne, and he is king of our lives. And so Jesus said, I will teach you to pray. And be sure to pray like this, as we talked about, as we continue to talk about uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. When he tells his, his, his apostles, when they ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. He says, here's how I want you to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? Look at that. Your kingdom come. May your kingdom come and what you want to be done here on earth as is in heaven. That verse is not obsolete. That verse is not outdated for us. This verse is relevant as long as Christian disciples are, are seeking God's will. It's very relevant. As long as we're seeking and searching to obey the will of God, we need to pray this prayer. We need to pray that that his kingdom come, that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, kingdom prayer, true kingdom prayer in our lives, it, what it does is it pursues the reign of God like the angels do. You see that? Here on earth as it is in heaven, that, that God's kingdom is come whenever God's will Whenever his will is done, just like it is in heaven. We say, well, how, how is God's will done in heaven then? Well, I want you to think about this. God's will in heaven is God's will is done completely, isn't it? You want to know how God's will is done in heaven? It is done completely. See, the angels don't get a command from God and then gather together and say, okay, now let's talk about what God has just commanded us and, and let's see which ones we think make good sense and which ones we want to follow and what parts we think we really should leave out. Maybe they're out of line with how I feel about things. And so I'm just going to kind of do a little bit of what God says and what he commands. I'm, I'm not going to do this part. Angels don't do that. You know what angels do? Angels do the will of God completely. That's how it is in heaven. They do his will completely. They also do his will immediately. Angels do not get a command from God and say, well, I can't get to it right now, God. I'll tell you what, I'll get to it later when I have more time because, whew, I'm real busy right now, God. God, I know what you commanded, but uh, I've, got, I've got all these other little angels running around, and I've got to take care of them first, and then I'll get back to what you want to do. They don't do that. They do what God commands immediately. Angels do the will of God completely, and they do it immediately. Here's the third thing they do. They do God's will joyfully. That's a big one. Well, look how they do things in the kingdom on earth as in heaven. In heaven, they do it joyfully. They are eager to do the will of God. <laughs> they can't wait to do something that delights God. They want to delight in God's will. It brings them pleasure to please God. Jesus says our prayers should be accompanied with the kind of passion that the angels display for fulfilling the desires of God's heart. Man, if we could feel like that about our own lives and how we pray to God and how we live our lives, that's what Jesus is saying you need to pray. Have your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How much passion do angels have to give God with his heart's desires? That's what we need to pray for. This suggests that one of our problems in prayer is not in asking for too much, 
but it's actually, actually asking for too little. See, we, we tend to pray for problems to be solved in our lives and hassles to be eliminated. In short, we, we tend to pray about our kingdoms, not God's kingdom. You get that? One of the things we've got to retrain ourselves is we tend to pray about our own kingdom and our own things going on in our own little world and what we need God to do to fix our kingdom instead of focusing on what's the will of God's kingdom. What does he want? How can I give pleasure to God? How can I obey God uh, completely, immediately, and joyfully? But Jesus is saying that the kingdom prayer is not about letting God in on my will. Kingdom prayer is asking God to fulfill his will. See, kingdom prayer wants to find the will of God, not bend the will of God. So when we pray for his will, that's when amazing things happen. Brothers and sisters, when we pray that God's will be done in our life, that's when the doors open up. The Apostle John says in 1 John 5, 14, that we can be confident that he will listen to us whenever we ask for anything in line with his will. So there's no limit to how boldly we can pray, especially when we're in the line with God's will. We want God's will as much as it is in heaven. When we are asking and when we are praying with passion like the angels have. When we pray for, for, with passion uh, for God to get what he wants, not just what I want. So then we shouldn't be surprised if we do that. And when we do that, we shouldn't be surprised when, when God opens the doors up. Uh, when, when he says, here you go. When amazing things start to happen. See, this also suggests for us that experiencing the reign of God on earth is in part a choice for us. Jesus says, for us to ask. Ask for the kingdom to come. It's something we, we have to choose to do. The fact is, whether we ask for the kingdom to come or not, the kingdom's going to eventually come one day, and the world is going to all see it. Uh, it's eventually going to come, whether we like it or not, and, and the world is going to say, well, well the kingdom is here. It, it, is, it is here. And at that point, at that time, every knee, the Bible says, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. And every creature is going to acknowledge that God's reign. They will have no choice. That day is coming. That day is going to happen. But right now, right now the king chooses to come, but only when he's invited. And we've got to make the choice to invite him in. So Jesus is implying that the quality of our experience of the kingdom of God is dependent on the sincerity of our request for it. See, God knows if we're just asking him to come to be polite. We do that all the time with folks, don't we? <laughs> you ever invite somebody to come over to your house just to be polite? You don't always expect them to really come, do you? Right? I'll come visit. Come visit. When I lived in Gulf Shores, I had to be real careful about saying that. I found out I had all kind of relatives I didn't even know I had when I moved to Gulf Shores. Hey, we thought we'd come visit. Sure you did. Live by a beach, of course. Right? You know, you had to be careful. Hey, hey, come visit anytime. Okay. All right? Sometimes we say things to be polite. We invite people, but not really wanting them to come. I don't think you thought it really meant, want you here? See, God knows if you're just praying, you're just saying, God, I want to do your will. And you're just trying to be polite. He knows. He knows if you're really sincere, if you're really mean or not. When you say, God, I would like for you to reign in me. I want, I want, I want you for you to reign and your reign to come. Are you just being polite? He knows. But the day is going to come when God's reign is going to come whether you ask for it or not. But right now, Jesus says, the quality of your experience of the reign of God depends on the sincerity of our requests. Depends on the sincerity of your request for it. So what are we really doing when we pray? What are we really doing when we pray for his reign? Think about that. 
Well, I think, first of all, that we are praying for God's rule to enter hearts. We're, we're asking God to expand his territory over the hearts of men. We're asking to expand his territory. It, it's a recognition that our will must be in submission to his will. That what I want and what I think I need are, are really secondary to what God wants and what he thinks I need. See, many disciples are not seeking his will. They're not seeking his will in all the chambers of their heart. Maybe in, in parts of their heart, but not in all of their heart. Only in those they choose to open. And often in the church, we, we have a, a mutated form of discipleship. And here's what it says. This mutated discipleship in the church says, There is room in the kingdom of God for selective obedience. Like this. You go to church? Well, of course I, I go to church. Do you lie? Of course I don't lie. Do you steal? No, I don't steal. Are you sexually pure? Now, wait a minute. I'm a man and I'm single. Do you, have, uh, do you give sacrificially? Hey, you know, times are hard. It's hard to give when things are hard. I have to take care of my stuff first. I, have to, I, I give out of, uh, of what's left over after I take care of all the other things first. Do you share your faith? Well, that's kind of hard. You know, I, I don't want people to think that I'm some kind of a Bible banger or, or a holy roller. You know, I don't want them to get the wrong idea. People at work, I don't want them to think bad of me. So no, I don't really share my faith. And today, for many, that passes for discipleship. Hey, as long as you're present at church, or as long as you're watching online, as long as you're, you're kind of there, Folks, let's not fool ourselves. Is that really serving the will of God? Today our culture has been so inoculated with Christianity that it has become vaccinated against the real thing. We know about vaccines, right? So when we pray, God's will be done. We are saying, God, all those parts of my heart that I have locked you out of, I am throwing wide open to you. All those parts of my life that I've, that I've tried keeping out, I want you to reign in all of my heart. Romans 6, 13, do not let any part of your body become a tool of wickedness. To be used for sinning. Instead, give yourself completely to God since you have been given new life. And use your whole body as a tool to do what is right for the glory of God. And that is so hard for us to do because as human beings, we want control. We don't want to give our control up, do we? But God says, if you really want to be blessed in your prayer life, if you really want to, to, to have God really use you, you've got to open yourself completely up to serving God. It also means that I want God's will to be done in the hearts of those who are not hunting for his rule. Not just in my heart. But I'm praying for the spread of the gospel. I'm praying that God doesn't just reign in my life, but he opens the, the doors to, to all those around me that, that don't even know him yet. That they will be open up. We are saying, God, take our hearts, starting with mine. It's also a prayer for God's will to engage history. We need to be ready for war if we're really seeking God's kingdom to come into everyone's life. Because, brothers and sisters, there is another kingdom out there. There's another kingdom that's around us. And he's saying, it's time for war. It's a prayer for him to engage history because the Bible calls it the dominion of darkness. And this kingdom does not want the kingdom of God in people's hearts. It does not want them to think or believe in God at all. And it will fiercely resist any attempt by the kingdom of God to diminish its borders. We don't like to talk about that much. Folks, we are in a, we are in a spiritual battle. And there's a kingdom of darkness that fights against the kingdom of God at every turn. And it is coming after you and me. And if we are not ready for war... 
If we're not ready for battle, we better watch out. To pray for the expansion of the kingdom of God is a war cry for battle. It's a war cry. Psalm 68, 1, it says, Arise, O God, and shatter your enemies. Let those who hate God run for their lives. See, it's not enough to pray, Your kingdom come, your will be done. We need to be burdened for the way things are on earth and not be willing to accept as normal what is perversely abnormal to our God in heaven especially. We, we've got to be so on, on fire. We need to be asking for the kingdom of the enemy to be displaced on this earth. We need to be praying that the kingdom of, of this earth be displaced and that God's reign takes over. Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, 17, Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You've not learned this from any human being. Matthew 16, 18, And I also say to you that you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The word gates shows that we are on an offense. Gates are a defensive weapon. Jesus is going to build a church that's going to advance against this other dark kingdom. He says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What, what does that mean? Well, look at verse 18 of Matthew 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Does that sound familiar? Again, I'm going to repeat myself. I say to you that if two, or, uh, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that you ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. He is giving the church, he's giving us authority in binding and loosing, so the church can take uh, to the gates of hell. Again, what is meant by this? <laughs> Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. It means... The disciples have the right to refuse the access. It means that we have the right to refuse the way things are as the things that they must remain that way. It, it, it says that marriages don't have to stay separated. People don't have to stay intoxicated. Churches don't have to remain stagnant. And the kingdom of darkness doesn't have to stay located in our schools in our streets and in our communities. We are disciples of the kingdom of God. We get to rebel against the way things are. We get to rebel the way the world wants things to be by agreeing that it is not, it's not our will, but, but it's God's will, and praying for his will to be done, and working to change the way things are. So we faithfully ask that the kingdom that is not of this world be manifest more clearly in this world. And we are to take the battle right to the enemy, and we're to take it to him on our knees. To pray, to ask God to replace this kingdom with his kingdom. This earthly kingdom, this, this worldly kingdom, replace it, God, with your reign. The one thing the enemy cannot take away from any of us is the power of prayer. So when we pray, God's will be done, we're not just praying for God to, to rule in our hearts. We're literally praying for God to enter into history and to change the way things are, to take back territory the enemy has illegitimately claimed as his own, and to see the church advance against the gates of hell. Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's rule must enter into our hearts. God's will needs to engage history. And thirdly, and finally, the seeking God's will prayer is a call 
to enact heaven. We live as disciples in the future tense. And as such, heaven is always on our minds. So we don't just pray for changes in history. We pray for the end of history. We pray for the consummation of the kingdom of God. We pray for the ultimate revelation that every knee bows and every voice says, God reigns. Brothers and there's coming a day when hunting the will of God will not be that hard. Because there will not be any others out there. There will be no other wills to, to, to follow. Uh, there will no, be no other will to confuse us. Because in heaven there is just one will. And we should long for the day when we don't have to hunt for God's will anymore. And we long for the end of the war. As Christians, we can believe that victory is guaranteed and that we are on the winning side because we have faith in Christ and we belong to him and that we will witness the full glory of the kingdom of God, that we will get to, to serve eternally in his courts. But we do get tired, don't we? We do get tired living in this world so evil. It gets weary. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2 says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. You know, it helps to know that Jesus has already won uh, the war. It should help us know that we already have the victory and that the reality of his victory will one day be universally recognized, that everybody will see. But sometimes we just need to pray. Sometimes we just need to pray to God and say, Lord, come soon. Or put an end to this, uh, this, this evil world we live in. Lord, come soon. Sometimes we can be afraid to pray for God's will in our lives. You say, well, I, I'm not sure I really want to pray for God's will in my life. But what, what if he wants me to be single all my life? What, what if he wants me to start a church in some kind of foreign country? What if he wants me to downsize my life? What if he wants me to, to change jobs or do something that's, that's out of my comfort zone? Well, what if, if, if I pray and he does that, what do I do about that? And the truth is that what God wants for me is what I would want for myself if I just had more spiritual sense. If I just trust him, what God wants for my life is so much better than what I can even imagine for my own life. We need to remember that Gethsemane was a God's will prayer. It was a God's will prayer, wasn't it? The Garden of Gethsemane, Christ himself said, Lord, if you'll take this cup and let it pass from me, if there's any other way, God, but the cross, if there's any other way that I can, I can surpass what I have to go through, please let it be. But, God, it's your will. Let your will be done. Lord, help us want what you want. This morning, if you need to give your life to Christ, or you, every Sunday we offer this, this time of invitation, this song of invitation, and there's a part of your life that you say, Lord, I need, to, I need to pray for your will to be done in my life. Maybe you have not allowed that like you should. Maybe it's time that you do. Maybe it's time that we all, as a church, together pray, God, let your will be done. This morning, if you need to come, we're going to sing this, in the, this invitation song. If you need to come, do so now as we stand and we sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Singing on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you.
have, we have two that have come forward and have asked for uh, prayers. Uh, Rachel Richardson comes and she, uh, she gave me this before the lesson this morning and she just says, I have let daily circumstances of life make me a tired Christian. As a new Christian, I was excited and alive and on fire for the Lord. Over the past 27 years, I've allowed time and the world to slowly chip away at my armor, making me weak and vulnerable. I ask for forgiveness and repentance of my past sins and mistakes. I ask for the strength and encouragement for my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to be alive again and keep my Christian light shining brighter than ever. Rachel, we love you. Appreciate that statement. And uh, we all that Christians can identify with that statement, can't we? All there have been times when we've been on fire and we've let that fire dwindle. And I just really appreciate your spirit and heart. We also have Ron, who many of you have hopefully met by now. Ron is just a, a great man. and He's been visiting with us for a while. And uh, this summer, I've gotten to spend some time with him on different youth events where he's come with us or has his grandson with him. And he's had a lot going on in his life. But he comes just, uh, one of the things he said when he first came up here, he said, I'm not worthy. And Ron, you are worthy. God says you're worthy because he loves you. He gave his son for you. And he said he wants to restore himself. He wants to be part of something great. He wants to repent of his sins and, and be part of the church and to be active. And, and Ron, God loves you. He forgives you. And we, we love you. We're glad you're here. Appreciate you. Let's pray for these two individuals this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that you do for us. Lord, thank you for your love and your mercy. Lord, this is a, it's a wonderful day when we can, we can talk about your kingdom and your reign. And Lord, we talk about the darkness of this world. And Lord, we can have two that have, they're not Satan's anymore. Lord, we can, we can glorify and, and, and praise your name and celebrate with the angels knowing uh, that two have rededicated themselves to you and that want to live for you. And, and Lord, we're thankful for that. <clears throat> Lord, pray that you forgive them. We pray that, that Lord, you restore them and, and that they, Lord, will, will have that fire within them. Lord, pray, pray for Rachel and, the, uh, and her comments, Lord, as she is wanting to be more of what you want her to be. We're so thankful for her as she's raising her her young daughters, and uh, we just pray that you help her in all the things and all the obstacles that, that Satan tries to put in her way. Lord, give her that fire and, and uh, that excitement of living for you again. Pray for Ron, Lord, this morning as he comes just asking that, uh, that you forgive him, that you restore him. Lord, we're so thankful for his heart. Lord, pray that you help work within his life as he becomes a part of the congregation here, that, Lord, we just, uh, we work together for your kingdom. We pray, Lord, again, that your will be done in our hearts and our minds in everything we do. Thank you, God, for all that you do. And, Lord, forgive all of us for our shortcomings and times we fall. Lord, please help us to always live to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> what a glorious day to celebrate with y'all. We'll sing one verse of this song. Please stand. Afterwards, Brother Ken will have a prayer for the giving and a closing, closing prayer as well. Let's get ready to go out there, folks. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus.
if you're wor worshiping here in the auditorium with us, uh, don't forget to leave your contribution in the box in the back. Uh, if you're online with us this morning, you can contribute online uh, through Venmo or PayPal or whatever app you choose. But uh, don't forget to do that. It's very important. Shall we pray? Father, we're thankful for the lesson this morning. And, and our prayer this morning is that we simply do your will. That when we see a need, that we have the courage to fulfill that need. When we see someone in need, that we take the time to help those people out. Father, we're thankful for a church here in Kingston that's willing to do that. A church that feeds the community, that helps house the homeless. Father, help us to do that individually in our lives. Again, Father, we're so thankful for your son who came, lived on this earth, experienced life on this earth, and was willing to die for us. Father, help us to, to live your word every day. Now, Father, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.